Works. Thanks for tuning in today and joining us on another SpiceWorks Partner Webinar, File Sharing Smackdown on-premise first on the cloud, brought to you by Connected Data. Before we get started, I do want to remind everyone this webinar will be recorded. If you have to step away for any reason, you will get an email with a link to the video in about a week. Also, there's a Q&A box on your screen to the left, and we encourage you to submit your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll get to those questions at the end via a verbal Q&A, but if your question isn't addressed live, someone with connected data will be able to follow up with you. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Russ Johnson, COO and VP of Sales. So Russ, whenever you're ready, take it away. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody for spending a little time with us today to uh, go over the concepts of uh, connected data and our transporter. We're going to talk about the benefits of on-prem private cloud solutions versus the public cloud. A little bit about uh, uh, connected data. Uh, we believe that uh, the public cloud uh, provides some convenience, but also provides a lot of shadow IT opportunities. And uh, we, we think that as IT managers, you need to eliminate shadow IT as much as possible and get control over uh, what's happening with your documents and, and your users' ability to share those documents and synchronize those documents. So this slide lists a few headlines that we've seen over the last 18 to 24 months, really showing that the public cloud isn't as secure as we once thought. The employees at the public cloud companies that need to have access and have access to your folders and files. The uh, terms and agreements for the uh, contracts that you sign for those services clearly state that they own your data in any way, shape, or form, and, that, and even in derivative works, and they can use that data in any way they like. You can see here that uh, uh, they have access to your folders and files, and certainly we've seen uh, evidence of uh, hacking, uh, providing access to your folders and files to, to other third parties. Um, as well as the ability for them to be required to turn over as evidence uh, any of the folders and files that might be in uh, your account without notifying you. Most companies like to be involved in that process as opposed to having a third party send it over without notice. So the public cloud isn't quite as secure and safe as we thought, and so companies are scrambling with finding out ways to get control over all the folders and files that are the company's data that's now up on public cloud storage solutions. This study shows that for the column on the right there, in companies of over 1,000 employees, greater than 43% of the employees admit to using public cloud storage services, even if the IT department has policies or the company has policies against them using those, policies, those services. So for, greater than 43% of your employees are probably using Box, Dropbox, some other form of uh, uh, public cloud services, uh, even if they've been told not to. And how that happens is your employees are used to logging in via VPN if they're if they're a remote worker or if they're traveling, and they're used to using this cumbersome VPN, getting uh, behind the firewall and accessing folders and files uh, via the traditional NAS or shared drive which was organized by somebody else, and they have a hard time finding their folders and files because it wasn't in, organized in a way that they think about their folders and files. And so once they find that file or the folder that they were uh, looking for, they think, wow, you know, I, I'd like to just have this in a more easily accessible fashion instead of this hard way. And I'm going I'm to save it up into my, cloud, uh, my, my public cloud service. So they keep it up there, and once that happens, the company's data is out of the company's control, and you don't know where it, hap where it goes after that. They could, they could share it out to somebody else in, a, you know, in the organization or outside the organization, or somebody uh, could uh, get access to those folders and files unbeknownst to the organization. Employees really aren't trying to do anything malicious. They're just trying to figure out an easier way to get their work done, but it does expose companies. So what are businesses doing about it? The donut there, the uh, bottom left-hand corner of this slide, really shows uh, a fairly impactful stat about what companies are doing about this. 80% of companies surveyed have an active policy to block 
public cloud storage services such as Box, Dropbox, or the like. So that means that IT departments or the security division of IT departments are continually looking for the ports that are open that are servicing these public cloud service providers and then closing those. But prohibition will never work. If an employee is intent on using that public cloud service because they think that helps them get their job done easier, they can jump on the guest wireless, which is usually open to uh, to any of uh, to any and all the internet, uh, or they could just uh, hop on their wireless hotspot, uh, or they access it from home. So really, companies need to come up with a strategy and a solution to provide that more simple access to folders and files instead of forcing them to use the old cumbersome methods. This study that was done by uh, Enterprise Storage Group actually is a survey done of companies that have already embraced the business or the enterprise version of Box and Dropbox. They've already embraced and signed up for those subscriptions. And even those companies who have signed up for those subscriptions, 97% of those enterprises are interested in bringing it back in-house, bringing it off the public cloud and back into a solution inside their data center that they know that they can rely on. And the reasons that they want to bring it off of the public cloud and back in-house is they want to, to be able to secure that data in a location that they choose. They want to know exactly where the data resides, who has access to it, and uh, if it's uh, being backed up correctly. They also want to be able to leverage off of their current infrastructure. So they're paying for networking, internet, uh, power and cooling, and they don't see a reason to provide profit to another company just to provide internet and power and cooling uh, when they have the ability to manage storage themselves. So they want to have it on-premise so they know exactly where it is and who has access to it, and leverage their existing infrastructure that they already have in place. That brings us to Transporter. Transporter is a fully integrated appliance that's a turnkey solution to provide cloud-like file sync and share capabilities to your organization, while at the same time keeping all the data on the premises that you choose behind your firewall in a, in a model that you can control. So it's got all the software, hardware, storage, compute power, everything you need all integrated into one appliance so that you can deploy a, a private cloud, your own personal private Dropbox, if you will. It extends existing file servers and NAS systems. We have the ability to connect to a standard SMB SIF share, so you can deploy those folders and files out to your mobile workforce and provide file sync and share capabilities to your employees. It's very non-disruptive to current systems and processes, as it's a bolt-on, not a replacement to your existing infrastructure, but a bolt-on and easy to implement higher capacity and performance in public cloud storage. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later, uh, but essentially it's using your LAN instead of having to hit the internet every time the file changes. Dramatically less expensive than public cloud and 100% private. So here's how Transporter works in a typical installation. You see the Transporter represented by the three rectangles or two U rack mount servers just to the right of the firewall. And they're making the data available to your external uh, or field uh, workforce uh, via a AES 256-bit encrypted tunnel between authorized devices. So authorized transporter devices could be the application on the tablet, on the phone, or on the laptop computer that you see there. Once they're authorized, it creates a uh, uh, AES 256-bit encrypted tunnel peer-to-peer -peer network between that authorized device and the transporters. The transporters make those folders and files available to the users that have been authorized to get access to those particular folders and files via that encrypted connectivity, that encrypted tunnel, without having to use cumbersome VPN. Users can self-organize folders and files, so it makes, makes it really easy for them to find the work that they normally uh, get access to. And at the same time, transporters can connect to your traditional NAS uh, a standard SMB SIF share uh, via what we call the network storage connector, represented here by the green arrow. It's a bi-directional synchronization which replicates 
in a, in a file seek and share manner, the data on your traditional SMB SIF share onto the transporter makes available outside and provides fi enterprise file seek and share capabilities in your organization. This is an example of a, of a typical deployment in a dispersed network. So if you have multiple locations, Transporter works really well to ensure that the, re the remote sites have local access to folders and files without having to depend on internet connections all the time in order to get access to those folders and files. So represented here at the corporate HQ, a couple of transporters um, uh, that may be uh, chosen based on user count or capacity requirements or or in data center redundancy requirements. And it shows here that it does have that network storage connector to the traditional NAS, uh, making the chosen folders and files off of that NAS device uh, available to the transporter infrastructure. And the branch office on the left-hand corner, maybe there's 50 or 100 people there, so it's too small to actually put their own NAS device, or you have had a hard time uh, ha having internet uh, connectivity and requiring VPN, connecti VPN connectivity all the way back hauled into the data center. So putting a transporter on site at that location gives those users their uh, local access to folders and files that they need to work with uh, uh, in an everyday scenario. While the remote mobile users have access to the folders and files from anywhere, if the headquarters were to lose power, for instance, and therefore go offline, the branch office is still up and running. They're using the folders and files the way they normally would with no interruption to service. And the mobile users have been automatically directed to the branch office because those folders and files are available. So they don't see a disruption into the service either. When the power comes back on for the corporate HQ, uh, the system synchronizes automatically and any changes that have occurred while they were offline get synchronized to the corporate HQ and then synchronized back to the uh, SMB SIF share that it was connected to. A transporter will work on its own without connecti connectivity to an app device, but a lot of our customers find that to be very helpful to uh, be able to provide mobile device access to folders and files that they already have in their NAS infrastructure. You can share with partners and clients. They don't need to have a transporter. You can share with them uh, just like you could any other cloud service. But if they do have a transporter, then they get local access to folders and files. So we find that very helpful with uh, large footprint files, such as graphics files in collaborative design environments and marketing companies, or CAD files for construction companies or architectural firms where they may have some geographically dispersed collaboration for those files. Here's a zoomed in view of how it works in particular with the uh, network storage connector. So inside the firewall represented by the big square, you've got the transporter represented by this 2U rack mount server. The transporter 75, 150, and 500 are the rack mount units that have the network storage capability built into them. Uh, the transporters are numbered by, based on the number of recommended users. And then we have here a representation of a NAS storage appliance. It's, and the uh, gold arrow uh, between the transporter and the NAS represents a link that was set up between the transporter and a chosen shared folder. You can set up several links for multiple shared folders or one link for a large group of shared folders, depending on the group that you want to make the, the folders available to. Outside the firewall, again, you see the authorized devices, mobile phones, laptops, and those are connecting via the uh, desktop app or the mobile device app for the transporter that creates this AES 256-bit encrypted peer-to-peer -peer network between the transporter and the authorized external devices. Transporter creates that, uh, that proprietary uh, encrypted link between all authorized devices, whether it be a mobile device or another transporter at a remote location. So you can see how the branch office is able to get uh, access to folders and files and uh, at land rate speeds and maintain its synchronization with the HQ. And HQ at the same time is able to 
save those folders and files onto the traditional NAS and do that, the, the processing that you normally would do in terms of backups or uh, other uh, audited processes that you might already have in place. We also make an SMB SIF share available, uh, a read-only share uh, available onto the transporter so that you can back it up by itself. That's one thing the cloud, uh, public cloud service providers don't offer is a way for you to back up your data. But we allow you to roll it right into your standard backup, audited backup routines. Partners and clients, as I mentioned before, can also share folders and files that are on the transporter. But you can limit them so they can't share it beyond that, that uh, location or that one user. We have the concept of guest users. So even though we have recommended number of users per transport or appliance, we've got a theoretical unlimited number of guest users that you can invite to collaborate and, and share folders and files. So you may have a particular client or uh, maybe a contractor that's helping on some design files or some documentation. And once they're finished with that project and it's all done, you can remove them from that shared folder and then it remote wipes any of the folders and files that they've been gaining access to off of their device as uh, the transporter um, application will uh, recognize that they've been removed from that folder and then delete the files and folders uh, from, uh, from their device, even if they don't have a transporter at their location. But as mentioned before, if they do have a transporter at their location, then they get access to the folders and files at land rate speeds. Here's a view of the interface. One of the things that comes up is how easy will it be to get my users to adopt the transporter. And essentially, we have a very common interface. It looks and feels just like Dropbox. So it's the Dropbox experience that they love. And it's very familiar for any users that uh, have already considered um, or tested out some files and can share. So we have the transporter icon that you click on to get access to your folders and files. You right, my, right mouse click on a folder or file, and then you get that contextual menu so that you can choose some transporter functions, which include undelete, so you can undelete all the folders or files that might be in a folder. You can do version uh, histories and, and revisions, so you can go back to an older version of a file. And to have that uh, very easy to access user experience that uh, users need today as opposed to the traditional cumbersome VPN access to a shared drive. Very familiar uh, look and feel and usage model. We have every public cloud benefit, including a, an API, public API, that allows third-party applications to be developed for the transporter. One example of that would be a vertical application for insurance companies, where an insurance adjuster needs to go out and maybe see some damage on vehicles or on, on homes, fill out their report, and then when they save, it saves directly to the transporter which takes that uh, information right to the transporter at the corporate HQ so it can continue to be processed by the workers there in the office. And if that insurance adjuster were to lose their tablet between visits, none of the personally identifiable information is lost. None of the work they've done that day is lost because it's all been, trans uh, it's all been saved out of the transporter. That's one example. So files you can share, just like Dropbox. Laptops can sync from any location. And we have mobile device access to the folders and files on the transporter from anywhere. And you can access terabytes of files over the Internet. Let's talk a little bit about the technology because I bet you're all wondering how it works. So these, uh, this graphic here on the left uh, has a couple of different uh, lines and arrows there. I draw your attention to the solid black lines or solid black arrows. That's the data path. That the data uh, in your transporter infrastructure travels only between authorized devices and is never held in the cloud and never transferred around any kind of a cloud infrastructure. So if you were to authorize these mobile devices on the top left, they will communicate directly with the transporter that has the data that you've assigned to them. It creates a, uh, an encrypted peer-to-peer -peer network uh, between the authorized devices and the transporter. So you can create a mesh infrastructure of your data, creating redundancy, guaranteed uptime, remote site replication, DR locations, all within this encrypted peer-to-peer -peer network that's created with the transporter. You can see the transporter to the right, 
uh, side of this graphic is um, replicated with the transporter in the bottom left for remote site replication. And then chosen folders and files are replicated to a transporter that might be at a smaller remote location for those employees to get access to folders and files. The way you establish a connection or authorize a device is in the form of a simple request. You request that a person in your organization um, have access to a folder, and that request is actually sent to our central service uh, represented at the top and connected by the dotted line. And the only thing that we receive up there is the email address and then that uh, request. We send that back to the user in the form of an email invite. If they accept that invitation, then that triggers our central service to send a message to the authorized transporter to create a peer-to-peer -peer connection between the authorized devices and that transporter. We only send the instruction to the transporter and not authorized devices in a form that tells them create a secure connection between you two. So we don't hold the authentication keys. We don't establish the encryption. We just send a message to the authorized devices, okay, you are allowed to speak to each other and communicate your data, so create your own encrypted peer-to-peer -peer, uh, link. But we never hold the keys. We never have, uh, we never maintain the encryption in the cloud. It's all always on your premises, on your authorized devices only. It's a lot like what Skype did when, uh, in the early days of voice over IP. The early voice over IP companies were using the large telco infrastructure, uh, the switching uh, infrastructure, and they were just providing that communication over the Internet connection. Um, and then Skype came along and said, we don't need that large telco footprint. We shouldn't have to pay for that but because our users have everything they need in order to connect and um, uh, and communicate. So Skype came along and implemented this model, and we've applied that Skype model to data. So we don't have the need for a large data center uh, in the sky somewhere, and thus causing confusion for you about where your data is. We're using uh, your uh, networking infrastructure, your power and cooling, with a very simple to deploy appliance to create a peer-to-peer -peer mesh network between authorized devices, so you always know where your folders and files are. This is a quick comparison about uh, um, the simplicity of accessing the folders and files from a connected data transporter solution as opposed to a traditional NAS. Traditional NAS is on-site, on-prem, higher performance, uh, very secure, while Dropbox provides ease of use that your users are demanding, mobile device access, uh, file sync and share capability without VPN. And connected data brings all the benefits of on-prem and cloud together in one easy-to-deploy solution that creates an environment of privacy and security so you can give the, your users the experience that they need while at the same time maintaining the control and security that you require. Quick overview of our products, uh, focused products. We can start off here with the Transporter 500, which is a, uh, a 3U account server, um, uh, recommended for 500 users. And then we have the Transporter 150 and 75, which are both 2U rack mount servers. Uh, the rack mount servers each have SSD metadata acceleration. They have dual redundant hot swappable power supply. They have uh, the ability to connect to a standard SMB SIF share so that you can deploy the folders and files on your traditional NAS onto the transport environment, thus providing mobile device access to your traditional NAS folders and files or your shares. We also have work group uh, transporters that are a desktop configuration. Um, they work on their own, but they were originally intended to be used in a, uh, a larger organization that has rack mount transporters uh, included. Um, and the smaller work group transporters are used in smaller sites where you might have uh, 30 or fewer people, but they need access, local access to folders and files. And they, it maintains uh, synchronization between the transporters at the home office.
So with that, uh, I want to uh, turn it over to some questions. I do see that there are some queued up here, so let's start off with the Q&A. All right, fantastic. Let's see. Our first question is from Jeremy. He asks, curious to know if a second site can be treated as an external partner. In our case, a second site would have, have low traffic and not a great need for storage. Yeah, it could be. So uh, I think the question is um, uh, whether or not uh, you're providing um, kind of a window into access and having your storage still held at the HQ. Absolutely, you can do that. So they don't need to have a transporter on site. Um, they can still get access to folders and files. Uh, they can be synchronizing those folders and files locally to their uh, desktops or laptops. Or you can set it up so that they're just um, accessing the folders and files directly from the transporter without synchronizing onto their local devices. Um, the benefits of having a transporter at the local site uh, are that those users get uh, local access to folders and files at land rate speeds, uh, but they don't need to have one at that local si at that remote site in order to get access to their folders and files. Great. Uh, let's see, Fred has a question. He wants to know how often do the sites replicate and update data? So with, uh, I'm going to use some terms here, <laughs> we could be really technical on this, but they are, uh, they are asynchronous um, with respect to uh, the bandwidth. Um, so they do at automatically and persistently synchronize all the time. The changes that occur, uh, the transporter uh, automatically and right now uh, synchronizes that, that those changes with the, with the other transporters that that particular file would be shared with. Um, so that happens automatically and persistently all the time and uh, limited only by the bandwidth you might have between a couple of sites, but uh, it, it's only, uh, you know, a second or two that you can see the changes actually get saved and, and, uh, and occur into another, into another location. Great, thanks. Uh, let's see, Dean has a question. Um, one of the challenges of cloud storage is the inability for mobile users to actually work with those documents without first downloading them to their device. How does Transporter address this issue? issue? Yeah, well, that is a good question. And in order to actually interact with that document, if you were to make changes and save it, um, you do have to uh, you do have to download it, open it up with the correct app, and then and then and then save it back, which you can do. But you can do that on uh, the transporter itself without having to have uh, the folders and files synchronized to that device. So uh, we have uh, a folder uh, concept that we call the library that has um, access only on the transporter uh, without having to have those folders and files synchronized locally. Great. Let's see what our next question is. Um, what happens when an employee leaves an organization? Does Transporter have a remote wipe availability? Yeah, great question. We sure do. Um, so when you remove a user from a folder or you remove them from your organization, it will remote wipe that uh, uh, folder and file from, uh, from the devices they've been accessing the transporter on. Um, so the way we do that is we send over a, uh, a removal signal uh, which initiates the remote wipe and then uh, we remove the token uh, from further access to that, to, to that particular device uh, so that we ensure that the remote wipe has, has occurred and then they no longer have access. Great. Let's see. Uh, is there a price change on the Transporter 75 and the 150 with the new connector feature? Uh, no, no price change. The uh, Transporter uh, 75, 150, and 500 all include the network storage connector so that you can deploy your uh, folders and files on your traditional NAS, NAS onto, um, onto the Transporter and out to mobile devices. What if a customer requires more than 150 users? Can the product scale? Great question. It sure can. It can scale up and out in a grid-like fashion. So if you needed uh, 300 uh, users, you would add two of the transporter 150s. 
Um, and so you can scale up uh, or out in order to accommodate user requirements or capacity requirements. Fantastic. Uh, let's see. Here's a good question from Matthew. When a file is changed, does the entire file get replicated or just the changes? Uh, just the changes. So that uh, reduces bandwidth requirements or consumption and uh, makes it very efficient. Great. Um, Jim wants to know, for off-site backup, can you use one of the smaller units uh, like the Transporter 30? Yes, you sure can. Uh, limited only by capacity. The 30 and the 75 actually have the same capacity, but the RAID configuration and the SSD metadata uh, acceleration is on the rack mount version. So you could uh, very easily deploy one of the 30s in order to uh, have a remote site replication or remote site DR backup of, uh, of what's on the transporter in your HQ. Great. Um, Lowell wants to know, will it work in a workplace without any servers, peer-to-peer -peer network only, and can it connect to shares setups on local computers? Uh, yeah, so it will work in a peer-to-peer -peer network uh, in an environment where there's no servers. Uh, we actually have customers that are taking their servers out and relying 100% on the transporter in order to provide that uh, uh, file access. Uh, so it will work in that environment. And there's uh, some configuration for the local shares on each computer to ensure that they're on the transporter and deployed correctly. So our support group can talk you through that. Fantastic. Let's see. Um, sorry, we've got quite a few questions, so just want to make sure that I don't miss yeah, anything. Yeah, great group. Lots of good questions. Yeah. Um, does it allow for multiple accesses to a single file? If so, how does it handle multiple changes? Ah, uh, yeah, good question. Yeah, it certainly does. So you can have multiple people accessing the same file at the same time. Uh, we rely on the application, which will, if it's an Excel file, for example, it'll pop up and say somebody's changing this file now. Do you, do you want to access it in a read-only mode? Um, and then give them read-only access, and then when uh, when the person that was making changes and was in edit mode uh, is out of the file, then the, um, the notice comes up and says, would you like to now be in edit mode? So that person can take control of the file. Um, if, in fact, there, were, uh, there was any uh, uh, conflict there, we save both versions and the most recent change wins. So you can go back to prior versions and uh, and restore that if necessary. We have an unlimited number of versions. I know that other other companies have a restriction on the number of versions, but we allow an unlimited number of versions, restricted only by the storage capacity of the transporter. Sorry, I was reading an entire question on mute. I apologize. <laughs> Dean wants to know, will authentication and authorization synchronize with existing Active Directory environment? If so, does Great ACL question. settings Sorry. on the CIF <laughs> folder automatically sync with the folder rights on Transporter? Sorry, it's a long question, Dean. <laughs> Yeah, that that yeah, that's a that's a super great question too. We do have uh, a, a couple of ways that we can provide uh, Active Directory integration. One is we have what's called an Active Directory connector, which actually you can point it at your Active Directory and then import that information into the transporter. Uh, that does not do bidirectional synchronization, so um, you, it will take the changes that you've done in the Active Directory and apply it to the transporter each time you run that routine. Or we partnered with some of the popular um, IDPs, uh, such as one login, so that you can uh, cr create that link between your Active Directory and the transporter that way. Great. Uh, let's see. David wants to know, the transporter products are listed on the Internet as having user capabilities. Is that a hard limit, or is the only limit the amount of storage? Uh, that is uh, that is a hard limit, but we talk to different customers about their intended usage. Uh, that is a hard limit that we apply based on an average of usage profiles. Um, 
actually, if it's, um, uh, so if, for instance, on the Transporter 500, if uh, you're using standard um, Office documents, uh, PowerPoint, Excel, Word, some PDFs, then um, you can scale just above that, but we just want to understand what your usage profile is like. Um, if it's larger files like CAD drawings, then um, uh, then that would be a that would be a hard limit. Fantastic. Let's see. Alex asks, any is there any ability to share outside of the country? I'm sorry, the company and control the access lifetime um, of the link. Yeah, so uh, great question. You can share outside the company. You can uh, set up the transporter organization so that users cannot share outside the company, if you wish. Um, and if you do that, you could also uh, have the ability to share links externally only that uh, would have an expiration date on them. Fantastic. Um... Uh, is it only offered with a hardware appliance, or can it be deployed via software utilizing our existing SAN storage? At this time, we're offering it only as a fully integrated appliance. The benefits of that certainly are that it's a very quick, easy to deploy solution. Uh, we see that uh, most of our customers really are up and running in 30 minutes, and within an hour, you've already got people that are uh, invited to shares and using shares and, and uh, using the, uh, the product. Um, we're looking at the ability to deploy uh, from a software standpoint um, based on certain approved hardware configurations, but that's not going to be out anytime soon. Um, so we're focused on delivering the product in a, a fully integrated appliance model. Fantastic. Let's see. Um, what if we need less than the provided storage? Can a transporter act as a NAS as well, providing drive mapping to shared folders for Active Directory and non-Active Directory users? So the transporter does not act as a NAS. Um, the uh, storage capacity is uh, based on um, usage patterns that we've identified over time and for a recommended number of users. Uh, and we find that some companies actually use the transporter instead of their NAS. Uh, once they've been able to migrate their data off the NAS, then uh, they can use the transporter uh, by itself. The network storage connector um, does require that it's on the same LAN. It, it's not technically required, but we recommend that it's on the same LAN as your SMB SIF share. And therefore, the uh, time for migrating data over or writing changes between the transporter and your NAS device is incredibly fast. Um, uh, our customers are, are very surprised at how quick that, uh, that occurs, how, how um, uh, quickly we can migrate the data over. Um, so some, some uh, customers choose to have maybe their internal users or some, some users still access the NAS, NAS device off their traditional share folders, um, while other users uh, elect to uh, access it on the transporter interface, uh, but some customers uh, have uh, gone with just the transporter only completely. All right, fantastic. So guys, we still have a ton of really great questions, but we don't quite have enough time to get to all of them. So we are going to wrap it up. Thank you so much for that awesome presentation, Russ. Hopefully everybody was able to learn a bit more. Russ, do you have any final words for our audience? Thank you for your time. I hope you learned something about Transporter. If you like some additional information, and there are some questions still here, but we're running out of time, uh, please contact us at sales at connectedata.com. Uh, we're happy to go over any questions or comments that you might have. Also, uh, we want to offer up um, uh, two things. We can do what's called a live look, where you can log in via screen share and actually interact with the Transporter and find out about how it works and, and uh, the administrative functions and uh, everything you might want to know. And we also provide a risk-free purchase. So if you purchase a transporter, um, you have the ability for up to 30 days to deploy it, get it used in your environment. We help you uh, get it set up and running, which usually only takes about 30 minutes to an hour, so you know everything about it, how to get it set up and going. And then you have 30 days 
um, to use it. And, and if it doesn't work the way that, uh, uh, that we say, then you can return it, no questions asked. So um, take us up on those two offers for a live look and uh, also risk-free purchase by reaching out to our sales group at sales at connecteddata.com. Thanks again for your time. Really enjoyed speaking with you. Some great questions, and I'm looking forward to talking to you soon. All right, fantastic, Russ. I do want to remind everyone, if your question was not addressed live, someone with Connected Data will be able to follow up with you. Also, if you had to step out or miss any part of today's presentation, you will be receiving an email in just a few days with a link to view the webinar on demand. Special thanks to Connected Data for sponsoring today's event and creating this awesome content. Also, thanks to each and every one of you for tuning in today. We hope to see you back soon for another SpiceWorks Partner webinar. But until then, stay safe and keep it spicy.